this lecture, we have to do small, short parts because otherwise uh, my computer gets unhappy. So finishing off with looking at kind of these misconceptions, I, I think is the last slide we may have done. I might be repeating myself, but just looking at the short-term energy deficit induced by physical activity um, along with the energy intake. So as we increase exercise, increase physical activity by overweight um, and with sedentary individuals, it's not necessarily going to alter the physiological need or the automatically produce con compensatory increases in food intake to balance the energy equation. So what we know is that um, low to moderate physical activity with recovery calories to total energy expenditure remains small relative to the full caloric expenditure. So a little bit of controversy exists between the quantitative contribution of um, excess post-exercise oxygen consumption with the total energy expenditure. With low to moderate exercise, which is performed by most patients who exercise for weight control, the contribution to recovery metabolism, what we call the so called, it's sometimes often called, referred to as the afterglow, the total energy expenditure remains small relative to the exercise energy expenditure. This can range up to 75 calories for exercise durations of 80 minutes. Um, additionally, exercise training induces a faster adjustment to post-exercise energetics and that um, reduce the magnitude of the total recovery of oxygen consumption. So calories burned during physical activity represent the most important factor in total exercise energy expenditure, not calories expended during actual recovery. So calories burned represent the most important factor. So when we add physical activity to a weight loss program favorably, it's going to modify the composition of the weight loss in the direction of greater fat loss and lean uh, lean tissue loss and the maintenance or even enhancement of physical capacity. So the effectiveness of regular phys physical activity for weight loss relates closely to the degree of excess body fat. So obese persons generally lose weight and fat more readily with increased physical activity than normal weight persons. You probably have seen this happen. Aerobic activity and resistance training, even without dietary restriction, provide a positive they call spin-off to the weight loss effort. What's going to happen, it's going to alter body composition favorably, reduce body fat with small increases in fat-free mass for the otherwise healthy, overweight person, uh, postmenopausal women, cardiac patients, physically challenged, um, with adolescent males who engage in regular vigorous activities showed less abdominal fat than sedentary counterparts. You probably knew that, right? Another good thing. Um, this is indicating that regular physical activity and improved aerobic fitness may target excess fat accumulation in the abdominal and visceral area that we talked about earlier to a greater extent than peripheral fat deposits. So even when the activity program produces no weight loss, substantial reductions um, occur in abdominal subcutaneous and visceral fat, right? That was the apple and the pear that we spoke about earlier. When you're looking at this figure, the muscle sparing effect of regular physical activity is really well illustrated here and what, what you're looking at. So it's comparing the effect of about a 10 pound weight loss over 12 months induced by either only caloric restriction, that's the red dots, or only physical activity, right? That's the yellow on MRI assessed through um, thigh muscle volume, and this was done among um, older 50 to 60 year old men and women. Decreases in thigh muscle volume, 6.8%, and composite knee flexion strength in VO2 max occurred only in the caloric restriction group, whereas the VO2 max increased 15.5% in the group losing weight via exercise. So. What I'm trying to say is that um, clearly muscle mass, muscle strength, and aerobic capacity decrease in response to 12-month weight loss with caloric, um, caloric restriction. When we're thinking about resistance training, it's going to provide important adjunct aerobic training for weight loss and weight maintenance and overall decreases in cardiovascular disease risk. The energy expended in like a circuit resistance training, continuous exercise using low resistance and high repetition, that's right? very common circuit, averages about nine calories per minute. This activity 
mode yields substantial calories during a typical 30 to 60 minute workout session. A little controversial, um, actually it's not controversial, we'll skip that, but um, when you're looking at standard conven um, resistance training that involves less total energy expenditure, it's going to positively affect muscle strength and fat-free mass during weight loss compared with programs that solely rely on food restriction. So individuals who maintain high muscle strength levels tend to gain less weight than their weaker counterparts, so that's the benefit of right now, everyone's staying um, engaging in strength training. Standard resistance training performed regularly reduces heart disease risk, improves gly glycemic control, favorably modifies lipoprotein profile, and it also increases, obviously we all know it's going to increase your resting um, metabolic rate, especially as fat-free mass um, is increasing. Looking at age related increase in um, adipocyte. This figure is showing body composition changes for 40 obese women placed into four different groups. We've got four different groups. We've got a control that have no exercise, no diet. The second group is diet only, so no exercise, right? Diet only, DO. The third is diet plus resistance, so D plus E. And the fourth is resistance um, exercise only, no diet. That's that EO, exercise only. So women trained three days a week for eight weeks. They performed 10 repetitions, each of the three sets of eight strength exercises. Body mass decreased for the diet only by about 4.5 kilograms. And when you looked at the diet and exercise, it was about a 40, 3.9 or 40 kilogram loss compared with the EO, exercise only, which was barely just a little bit over 0.5 kilograms. In the control group, they lost kind of the same, 0.4 kilograms. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that fat-free mass increases with exercise only 1.1, whereas diet only group lost 0.9 kilograms of, of uh, fat-free mass. So what these researchers concluded is that restricting, you know, exercising with, with caloric restriction program resistance training is going to preserve that fat-free mass better than just diet restriction alone. So you probably knew that, right? That was, would be your hypothesis, probably. The total energy expended and um, physical activity relates to what we call a dose-response matter of effectiveness of physical activity for weight loss, a dose response. So a reasonable goal progressively increases moderate activity to between 60 to 90 minutes daily or a level that burns around 2,100 to 2,800 calories weekly. So to, what we want is to fight back about this worldwide obesity epidemic. Public health perspective must really be promoting populations need to increase total daily energy expenditure substantially, really increasing it regularly rather than increase the effort of intensity solely so to induce a training response, right? An overly fat person who starts out with light physical activity such as slow walking accrues a considerable caloric expenditure simply by extending exercise duration. So going longer and not necessarily more vigorous. So the focus on duration offsets the um, inadvisability of having a sedentary obese individual begin a program with more strenuous, vigorous physical activity. Also, energy costs of weight-bearing physical activity really relates directly to body weight. So the overweight person expends considerably more calories in weight-bearing activity than someone who's average weight, right? The load that's going on on the body. The duration of physical activity affects fat loss. So this is showing us, this table is showing us changes in body fat in three groups of men who exercise 20 weeks by walking and walking and running for either 15, 30, or 45 minutes per workout. The data also includes distance covered, uh, so total duration of weekly workouts, training heart rate, body mass, and they use six different skin fold sites and weight in the waist girth. Um, and it all remains stable. So comparing these three groups, a 45-minute group lost more body fat than either the 30-minute or the 15-minute group. So this difference was closely linked to greater caloric expenditure, longer activity, longer duration. We call this that dose-response relationship. So to determine the optimal exercise frequency for weight loss, subjects exercise 30 to 47 minutes. They did this for 20 weeks, and they, again, either ran or walk with activity um, intensity between 80 to 95% of their heart rate max. So training twice a week produced no changes in body weight, skin folds, percent body fat. However, training three to four days per week did. Subjects who train four days a week reduced body weight and skin folds more than subjects who train three days a week.
The percentage of body fat decreased similarly in both groups. Individuals um, should thereby be participating in physical activity at a minimum of three days a week to favorably alter body composition. The additional caloric expenditure with more frequent activity produces even greater results. So the threshold energy expenditure for weight loss probably remains very highly individualized per each person. The cal um, calorie burning effect that each activity session would eventually reach at least 300 calories whenever possible. So this generally occurs with 30 minutes of moderate to vigorous running, swimming, cycling, or circuit resistance training. That's about or 60 minutes of really brisk walking. So the initial stage of physical activity with weight loss programs with somebody who's previously sedentary or an overfat person should be developmental and moderate intensity demands. So start slow. The individual should not adapt long-term goals and personal discipline. Um, sorry, not should not. They should be, right? They should be slowly adopting some long-term goals. They should be becoming more disciplined. They should be restructuring their eating and activity behaviors. Um, unduly rapid training progression, progressions prove over um, really counterproductive. So going too fast, too soon, too vigorous because overfed individuals initially resist increasing their physical activity. So during the first few months, intervals of faster paced walking can replace slow walking. Meaningful changes in body weight and body composition require a minimum of about 12 weeks to really get it under their belt. So most fat um, overfat persons can realistically expect to reduce the body fat by about 5 to 15% with programs that focus on modifying eating and exercise behaviors. So the behavioral approaches should foster lifestyle changes that include physical activity helps, you know, for time management. There's no selective effect that exists among diverse modes of big muscle aerobic activity. So equivalent energy expenditures to favorably reduce body weight, body fat, skin, full thickness, and girths. So this example shows men and women generally self-select a higher energy expenditure level, right? So looking at their energy with their heart rate at similar ratings of perceived exertion for running for 20 minutes on a treadmill than when performing stimulated cross-country skiing, cycle ergometer, aerobic cycle. So men selected a higher absolute level of exercise intensity and oxygen consumption than women in each exercise mode. Treadmill running generated the greatest total oxygen consumed, right, energy expended for both groups. Uh, for individuals without physical activity limitations, running usually provides the most suitable activity to provide the most maximizing energy expenditure. So combinations of Increased activity along with caloric restraint, often considerably more flexible for achieving a negative caloric imbalance than either exercise alone or diet alone. Dietary restraint plus physical activity, increasing physical activity through lifestyle changes offer health and weight loss benefits similar to those from combining dietary restraint and vigorous program of structured physical activity. So what am I saying, right? Adding Physical activity and to a weight control program is going to facilitate long-term maintenance of fat loss, um, then total reliance on either just food restriction alone or just simply exercising alone. This is summarizing the benefits that you're all super aware of. We all know the physical activity in a weight loss program is really going to help resting metabolism, um, less reliance on caloric restriction, long-term success of weight loss, overall um, increases overall size of energy deficit, really facilitates um, lipid mo mobilization and oxidation, especially with that in the visceral, visceral adipose de um, deposits, offsets deterioration of the immune system, all of these great benefits that you're already um, very well aware of. So regardless of the approach one takes for weight loss, a statement from the National um, Task Force on Prevention and Treatment of Obesity really best sums, sums up the difficulty in solving the overly fat condition on a long-term basis by saying, quote, obese individuals who undertake weight loss efforts should be ready to commit to lifelong changes in their behavioral patterns, diet, and physical activity. Unfortunately, despite the importance of regular physical activity, fewer than one half the people, right, 40%, trying to lose weight, maintain weight where regular active, regular activity during leisure time um, is really represented in, in nationally in, in sample and research, which is so unfortunate. 
So the notion of spot reduction, right, it really is this belief that an increase in muscle, muscles, metabolic activity stimulates relatively greater fat mobilization from adipose tissue in proximity to the active muscle. As such, what we know is moving a specific body region to sculpt or tone should selectively reduce more fat from that area than moving to a different muscle group at the same metabolic intensity. Advocates for spot reduction recommend performing large numbers of sit-ups, side, side bends to reduce excessive abdominal and hip fat. The promise of spot reduction with physical activity seems attractive with aesthetically um, and health risk standpoint. And for, unfortunately, all of this, this critical evaluation of research does not support this, right? So it does not work. We cannot be telling people it works. It doesn't work. An interesting question concerns the possibility of a gender difference in the responsiveness of weight loss to regular physical activity. So a big meta-analysis of 53 different research studies on this topic concluded that men generally respond more favorably than women to the effects of physical activity on weight loss. One possible explanation involves gender difference in body fat distribution. As we discussed a long time ago in the beginning of this lecture, fat distribution in the upper body, right, the abdominal, the central, the android fat shows active lipolysis to sympathetic nervous system stimulation and becomes preferentially mobilized for energy during physical activity, right? That's kind of the apple. And consequently, greater upper body fat distribution in men may contribute to greater sensitivity to lose fat in the abdominal region with regular activity. Women may also more effectively preserve muscle balance with increased physical activity. So men often reduced energy intake with training, whereas the um, depression of food intake with exercise may be a little less for women. When we think of weightlifters, gymnasts, you know, other athletes in sports that require a high level of muscle strength and power right, per unit of body mass, often must reduce body fat without compromising athletic performance. So any increase in relative muscle strength and short-term power output capacity could improve com competitive performance. So what I want to focus on is really on wrestlers, right? So think about um, applying to physical to all physically active individuals who desire to reduce their body fat without negatively affecting health, safety, and physical capacity. So to reduce injury and medical complications from short and longer term periods of weight loss and dehydration, many, the ACSM, NCAA, AMA, recommend assessing each wrestler's body composition um, in the federal State High School Association requires the adop adopting weight certification beginning back way back, I don't know, 2005 season. The assessment takes several weeks prior to the comp competitive um, season beginning to determine minimal wrestling weight based on percentage body fat. 5% body fat, that's using hydrostatic weighing is usually or skin fold equation based on population data, represents the lowest acceptable body fat level for safe wrestling. So hydrostatic weighing and skin fold assessment of body fat recommended by the NCAA has been validated by lots of research. For wrestlers under the age of 16, 7% body fat represents the recommended lower limit. Um, body fat must be determined um, using a hydrated state because between two to five percent of the body weight through fluid restriction on exercise in hot environments, which is commonly used by wrestlers, violates the assumption necessary for accurate and precise prediction of minimal wrestling weight. So, you know, really taking a look at practical applications to determine minimal wrestling weight and appropriate. Um, so ACSM recommends that weight loss should really progress gradually and not exceed more than one to two pounds per week. We really don't want to alter the, the um, athletic ability by, you know, really rapid weight change. So, um, opposite, gaining weight to enhance body composition and physical performance and activities um, that require muscle strength and power or aesthetic appearance pose a unique problem that's really not easily resolved. So most persons focus on weight loss to reduce excess body fat and improve overall health and appearance. But there are going to be people you're going to work at that are going to be the opposite. So body weight and fat gain per se occurs all too rapidly by tilting the body's energy balance in favor of greater caloric intake. Weight gain for athletes should represent an increase in muscle mass, right? Accompanied connective tissue. 
Generally, this form of weight gain occurs if increased caloric intake, carbohydrate for adequate energy and protein sparing, with amino acid building blocks of protein um, for tissue synthesis accompanies a balanced and really progressive resistance, right? Resistance uh, exercise regimen. So really using weight training. Endurance training usually is going to increase fat-free mass, but only slightly. The overall effect reduces body weight because of fat loss from ca uh, calorie burning and possible appetite depressing effects of this activity. So in contrast, muscle overload through resistance training supported by adequate energy and protein intake with sufficient recovery increases muscle mass and strength. Adequate energy intake, um, that no uh, catabolism of protein available for muscle growth occurs from an energy deficit. So intense aerobic training should not coincide with resistance training to increase muscle mass. More than likely, the added energy and perhaps even protein demands of concurrent resistance and aerobic training impose a limit on muscle growth and responsiveness to resistance training. So um, and it, it should be also stated that molecular level aerobic training may inhibit signaling of protein synthesis in the skeletal muscle to negatively impact the muscle's adaptive response to resistance training. So really a prudent recommendation increases daily protein intake to about 1.6 to 2 grams per kilogram of body mass during resistance training period. The individual should be consuming a variety of plant and animal proteins, relying solely on animal only. It's very high in saturated fatty acids and cholesterol, which would potentially down the road lead to um, increased heart disease risk. So individual differences in daily quantity of nitrogen incorporated into the body protein um, and protein incorporated into the muscle also limit and explain differences among persons in muscle mass increases with resistance training. So this photo is showing you eight of the different factors that affect the responsiveness of lean tissue synthesis with um, that we see with resistance training and you know you see this all the time in the gym. So we have gone over a lot. I, we've done a lot of obesity. I've done a lot of um, previous stuff over the weeks. This kind of is going to begin to kind of wrap up our obesity stuff. But a lot of good content in this lecture. Um, this week, the only thing that we are going to be looking at is um, the quiz. You're going to be able to take the quiz twice. Um, I just want to make sure we understand the adipose cell. I want you to understand fat you know, brown cell versus the white cell. I want you to understand the apple versus the pear. Um, some of the key stuff that's really important as you go out into the world and begin um, working with people with uh, w that are over fat and obese um, and trying to figure out how do we help make a difference? How do we help not only lose weight, but actually be able to figure a way for weight maintenance? So I'm not going to read you the summaries because you're done listening to me talk, but I'm going to have the slides available for you to look through. Um, the summary has a lot of information. This covered a lot of really good stuff.